after the resurrection of Christ, what day are we supposed to remember and keep holy? Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, Friday? I've heard the arguments in the eschatology. Some say it's Saturday, some say it's Sunday. Some say if you worship on Sunday, then that's a pagan day or the devil's day created by Constantine. And they say that you're actually taking the mark of the beast. So what day? Yeah, let, let's let's talk about that real quick. What do you guys think? Um, I think we should talk about that. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> That's a good idea. So, um, so let me repeat what he's saying. He's like, you know, some say it's Saturday, some say it's Sunday. What day should be, you know, worshiping um, God? And he, his exact words, he says, some say if you worship on Sunday, then that's a pagan day or the devil's day created by Constantine. And I saw what the prepared Adventist had mentioned um, in the comment section earlier. Um, you know, so yeah, th there is some things about the Constantine argument as well. But I want to show why. Um, like, where did the Sunday actually start? Um, this Sunday observance, because like, if you look purely at the Bible, you don't get Sunday observance, right? Like, there's no there's no commandment in the Bible that says worship God every single Sunday. It's always have a holy convocation on Sabbath. You know, Jesus kept the Sabbath holy. Uh, book if Book of Acts, you see Paul as his custom was went in the synagogue every single Sabbath. Like every time you see them having like a, a corporate worship or, you know, get together, it was always on Sabbath, you know? Um, and that was the day that God commanded. So then the question is, where did Sunday observance come from? So I just wanted to share just a little bit of history of this and I'll probably take like four minutes, but um, let's talk about this. One thing that we should consider when Paul, uh, Paul was leaving, like in the book of Acts, he said one of these things to look out for in the last days or the time after he would leave them. Right. He says, wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you how much of the counsel of God. Sorry. What does that word say? This one right here. All, all, all of it. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Can I just pause right there and just have a, a like a, just a sermon on that word? Like Paul is saying he declared all the counsel of God. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. So what that means Amen. is that everything that they were supposed to do is in the scriptures. Did Paul Amen. mention anything about keeping Sunday holy? No. So does that mean anybody who comes afterwards that says, keep Sunday holy. Are they preaching what Paul preached? No. No, because Paul said, I declare unto you all the counsel of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. All the counsel of God. That means Sunday was not a part of the counsel of God. If Paul ain't say it, it's not of God. All right, that's my little sermon. You could collect offerings. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's move right along. He says this, take heed therefore unto yourselves and all, to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he have purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So he's warning them also of your own selves, meaning people that are calling themselves Christians of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So he's warning them. There's going to be people that are coming in among you that are going to speak things contrary to what I'm telling you. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Amen. So now let's talk about how Sunday observance actually came to be. And this is from um, a Catholic source. It's a Catholic magazine. You can see the quote, um, the reference on screen from Sabbath to Sunday. This is how they say Sunday came to be. And it starts off with this man named Ignatius. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of uh, critics of Seventh-day Adventists out there who very rarely show you any Bible verses. What they show you is, oh, this Catholic priest and this church father and that church father, they always getting their answers from these church fathers on why they do what they do. But we don't do that here. We get our answers from thus saith the Lord. The commandments that we are supposed to keep are from thus saith the Lord, or it is written, right? Not because some church father said, this is what we do. Because Paul made it clear 
I declare to you all that you're supposed to do. So now if these church fathers are saying something else that Paul ain't say, what are we talking about here? But anyway, I digress. In the year 110, only 12 years after the death of the last apostle, Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, calls the Sabbath antiqu anti antiquated. So Ignatius is calling the Sabbath antiquated. The full passage of the letter of Ignatius to the Magnesians reads, Do not be led astray by other doctrines, nor by old fables which are worthless. For if we have been living by now according to Judaism, we must confess that we have not received grace. The prophets who walked in ancient customs came to a new hope, no longer sabotaging, but living by the Lord's day, on which he came to life through him and through his death. So this is all based on misunderstandings of what the word of God says. The Lord. day that is called the Lord's day, the only biblical day that's called the Lord's day is the Sabbath day. Read Isaiah 58, verse 13. Read Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. Jesus says, Lord. I am Lord of the Sabbath. Lord. But this is where they're starting to digress from what the Bible says and going into their own traditions. But that's what Ignatian said. Let's see how it developed. There is widespread belief among Christian scholars that the institution of Sunday worship occurred in an apostolic or post-apostolic age in commemoration of the resurrection. The New Testament itself never calls Sunday the day of resurrection, but consistently the first day of the week. This is from a Catholic source. This is what they're saying. Moreover, nowhere does the New Testament suggest that the Lord's Supper was celebrated in commemoration of Christ's resurrection. Neither do the earliest post-apostolic writings invoke the resurrection as a reason for Sunday worship. This is all from the same source. Here's the next person that speaks about it. The Epistle of Barnabas, 130 to 135, is the first explicit mention of the Lord's Day worship being based on the resurrection. Listen to what he says in his reasoning behind dropping the Sabbath. He says this, finally, he, meaning God, says to them, I cannot bear your new moons and Sabbaths. That comes from Hosea chapter 2, verse 11, right? I can't bear your new moons and your Sabbaths. Well, verses like that, right? You see what he means? It is not the present Sabbaths that are acceptable to me, but the one that I have made. On that Sabbath day, which is the beginning of another world, this is why we spend the eighth day in celebration, the day on which Jesus both arose from the dead and after appearing again, ascended into heaven. So he's basically saying that verse from Hosea 2, God could not bear their Sabbaths. And that's why we're not keeping it anymore. And that makes absolutely no sense because what God was actually saying in those verses was like, look, like you're, you're, you're honoring me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. God was not saying that he's getting rid of his Sabbath. He's saying, I can't accept yours, the way you're behaving and, and desecrating my Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And how do we know that God is not getting rid of his Sabbath? Because of that verse that Teller read, from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come to worship before me, says the Lord. God is not getting rid of his Sabbath. He just was having an issue with the people. But how, he, how Barnabas interpreted it was like, look, that's why we're keeping the eighth day holy. But I'm going to show you the Huh? I didn't know there were eight days in a week. <laughs> and so that's why, but I'm going to show you another reason of why it's, he had a big issue with the Sabbath. But let's move right along. And here's the real reason why Sunday worship became a lot more popular. And I'm going to show you more. It's going to be very clear when I'm done. In the year 135, Jerusalem was sacked and the Roman Emperor Hadrian. What's his name, y'all? Hadrian. Hey, Hadrian, right? The Roman Emperor Hadrian prohibited Sabbath worship throughout the Roman Empire. Did y'all catch that? Mm -hmm. He prohibited Sabbath worship. How did people respond when he prohibited Sabbath worship in 135? Hadrian also prohibited anyone of Jewish descent from living in Jerusalem. A new Christian community was recruited for Jerusalem from other nations, and the bishops of Jerusalem until the mid-3rd century bore Greek and Roman names. Thus, after 135, even the Jerusalem church worshipped on Sundays. Hadrian's prohibition against Sabbath worship spelled the end of the Sabbath or Sunday problem for the early church. Another council was not necessary. Hadrian made a law that says no more worship on Sabbath. And people were like, ah, do I die or keep the Sabbath? You know what? Sunday sounds a little bit more attractive now. I'll go a little further. Then we get to Constantine. 
In the year 321, the Emperor Constantine made a new edict known as the Sunday Decree. It says, all judges and city people and the craftsmen shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. This is why we talk about Constantine, because now he's making the first law for the whole land that everybody, all judges and city people and the craftsmen shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. That's what Constantine did. So you can see that there was a, a gradual turning away from the keeping of the Sabbath and in incorporating Sunday worship, all based on tradition and all based on these these things that I'm showing you on the screen. And by the way, it's very interesting. The next part of it says the only people that were safe were those who lived in the country. And it just so happens that Seventh-day Adventists preach country living because it says country people, however, may freely attend to cultivate to the cultivation of the fields because of the if it frequently happens that no other days are better adapted for planting the grain in the furrows or the vines in the trenches so that the advantage given by heavenly providence may not for the occasion of a short time perish. So it just so happened, even in Constantine's time, that <laughs> only those who lived in the country were left alone. And it just so happened Seventh-day Adventists preached country living during so the time of the Mark of the Beast. So us Adventists, let's not spurn country living. Amen. Mm -hmm. It says, at the time this law was instituted, Sunday worship had been universally practiced in the church for at least 170 years. Mm -hmm. The significance of the law, however, was that in sanctioning Sunday as a day of rest, the emperor implicitly recognized Christianity as the state religion. Constantine refers to Sunday as a day of the sun, according to the Roman tradition. OK, so that is the history of how Sunday came to be. But now I'm going to show you the other side of it. So this comes from uh, a ministry magazine. You see the quote on screen. It says this, anti-Sabbath theology goes back to the time of the Roman, Roman emperor, what's his name, y'all? Hadrian. Hadrian, who promulgated anti-Jewish legislation in AD 135 that categorically prohibited the practice of Judaism in general and Sabbath keeping in particular. Hadrian was like, no more Sabbath keeping in 135. His aim was to liquidate Judaism at a time when the Jews were experiencing resurgent messianic expectations that exploded in violent uprisings in various parts of the empire, especially Palestine. He was afraid of what Jews were doing and, and them taking over and their Messiah that they were waiting for, even though it wasn't Jesus that had already passed. But he wanted to shut down anything Jewish related. And it says here, Sabbath keeping in particular. Let's go on. At that critical time, Roman authors produced a body of anti-Semitic literature attacking the Jews, both ethnically and religiously. Christian authors joined the fray by producing their own anti-Jewish polemics. Now look whose name. For example, the author of the Epistle of Barnabas defames the Jews as, now look what he calls the Jews, wretched, wretched men, man. abandoned by God because of the ancient idolatry and rejects any historic validity to their religious practices like Sabbath keeping. So what was the real motivation behind what Barnabas was saying? Anti-Semiticism. Yep. Yep. So this is what it was. This is what it was. There were so many things that were fighting against Jewish religions and that they just lumped Sabbath day in there. But let's keep reading. It says at about the same time, Justin Martyr. This is another guy that is often quoted by certain, you know, critics as their church fathers and showing the, the history of how Sunday came to be. But they don't show this side of it. At this, about the same time, Justin Martyr developed a Christian theology of Sabbath by showing contempt for the Jews and by making the Sabbath a temporary Mosaic ordinance. Notice how I was calling it an ordinance. Where do they get this understanding that the Sabbath is an ordinance? From a misunderstanding of Colossians chapter 2. The Sabbath was never an ordinance. The feast days were, right? The ones mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23, the, the Passover, you know, Pentecost, all those other things, they were ordinances. The seventh day Sabbath was not an ordinance, but they lumped it as an ordinance. So it says making the Sabbath a temporary mosaic ordinance meant solely for the Jews, a mark to single them out for their punishment. They so well deserve for their infidelities. Justin argues that the new covenant demands not refraining from work on one day of the week, but observing a perpetual Sabbath by abstaining from sin. 
This sounds too familiar to what's being said today. Every day is Sabbath, is what they're basically saying. And that's what Justin Martyr was basically saying. He's like, you just need to keep one day holy, but every day is really the Sabbath. This is the stuff that he was saying. This goes back to what Paul was saying, that people, I taught you everything, but people are going to come in twisting everything. Justin's anti-Sabbath theology has been pro proposed in different ways throughout the centuries. In recent times, dispensationalists and those urging unsubstantiated views of the new covenant maintain essentially the same view. Basically, what it's saying is people believe that today. That the Sabbath is a temporary Mosaic ordinance meant only for Jews and thus not binding on Christians who observe the day spiritually by accepting the rest of salvation without any cessation of work on the seventh day. That came from Justin Martyr. In the second century, Christians were urged to spend the Sabbath day fasting rather than feasting. Here's another issue about the Sabbath day and what was done. They put so many burdens on the Sabbath day and said, if on the Sabbath day, yeah, keep it, but you must feast fast instead of feasting. A practice probably first introduced by the Gnostic Marcion around 150 during that time of anti-Semitism, well known for his anti-Judaic and anti-Sabbath teachings. Sabbath fasting was promoted by papal decrees in order to show, as Pope Sylvester said, separation from and contempt for the Jews. These are their own words. The Catholic Church enforced its practice for centuries. In fact, in the 11th century, Pope Leo IX attempted to impose Sabbath fasting on the Eastern Greek churches. Their refusal to accept Sabbath fasting contributed to the historic breakdown be, uh, break between the Roman and Eastern churches in AD 1054. All right, so I'm done. So I just wanted to show that, that this whole, where did Sunday come from? It came from traditions. It came from anti-Semitism. But Paul said in Acts chapter 20 that, hey, I gave you all the counsel of God. None of the counsel of God was keeping Sunday holy. So these came in as tradition. They started having anti-Semitism. They didn't want Jews to do anything. And so they attacked the Sabbath. They were like, nope, we're not keeping the Sabbath. We're going and they have misunderstandings of Bible verses and saying, you know, you know, God hates the Sabbath, not realizing that we're going to keep the Sabbath in heaven. And then, you know, they like Hadrian comes, he, he makes laws against it. People are like, uh, all right, if I continue to keep the Sabbath, I'm going to die. So you know what? Sunday sounds a little bit better. They said, you have to fast on Sunday. That's not a fun day, but I mean, you have to fast on the Sabbath. That's not a fun day. Sunday seems more appealing. They slowly went into a tradition of keeping Sabbath. And by their tradition, they made know the commandment of God that said to keep the Sabbath holy. And so that's really what it was about. And that's where Constantine comes in. And he says, you know what? I'm making a whole law for the whole land. Whether you're a Christian or not, everybody has to rest on Sunday. And so that's where we wouldn't put in on Constantine for the whole uh, Sunday law thing. But um, yeah, it was a tradition I was building up over time. Yeah. C can I just add something to what you said real quick, Jason? Sure. Um, I really appreciate this comment right here from the Prepared Adventists, because I think that us as Adventists, we have to get sharper in the language that we use. We, we have to stop saying that it was during Constantine's time that Sunday worship came into existence. No, Sunday worship was in existence long before that. But during Constantine's time, as Jason showed, was the first time Sunday worship was institutionalized. It was the first time that it became law. It was the first time it became a decree. And, you know, leading up to that was just a whole history of anti-Semiticism, where in 135, you get your first anti sabbatarian laws. And so we have to stop saying that, you know, Sunday worship came from Constantine. It came before that, but it was the first time in history where it was law, it was institutionalized that Sunday was the day of worship. So. Amen.